Welcome to the Startup Grind. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friend Seth Goldman. There we go. There we go. All right. Here we go. Here we go. I'm so sorry. Okay. I appreciate you all staying. No problem. They're they're all gonna we're all hanging out for beers awesome. afterwards, so awesome. we're good. So there was a tornado in Atlanta today. Yeah. yeah. Mike, can you hear me? Yeah, you, yeah, you can oh. use that one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. Okay. Use this one. Tornado in Atlanta today, and um, they haven't had bad weather there in, in literally like six weeks, and it just hit today. And I literally was going to went to Southwest, went to American, went to United, and each flight was just closing up. So it just, uh, but I'm really glad to be here. I really appreciate y'all staying. And I look forward to sharing a bit about um, the entrepreneurial journey. I was just going to say excuses, excuses, <laughs> but now you know. <laughs> yes, exactly. Dang, those tornadoes. Okay, yeah. so we're going to get right to it. Uh, uh, and the thing is, is that um, we always thank. By the way, man, this I can't believe everyone here like stayed. I, I, <laughs> so, I, I appreciate I mean, that's it. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I feel bad. I feel <laughs> no, bad. No, no, you don't feel bad. I, I mean, do. you just give us yeah. discount codes for uh, <laughs> for tea later. Uh, okay? I, do we have You're going to send it to here? me, right? Well, we Promo codes, here. and then I'll send it out to them? Okay. <laughs> Bulk. Okay. Um, so we always like to start on a personal note. So Great. let's start with you. Yeah. Um, where were you born? Yep. Where were you raised? Yep. What did your parents do? Yeah. And then perhaps talk about your first entrepreneur experience. And oh, please yeah. don't say it's a lemonade stand. That you selling lemonade <laughs> drinks. Okay, so let's start with you. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Wellesley, Massachusetts. My dad was a professor at Wellesley College, uh, taught in the economics department, and my mom was a professor at Boston University. So um, we did grow up right next to the Wellesley campus, and my first job was um, the, the part of the campus that was closest to us was the golf course. And so uh, my first job was finding golf balls that it, the golfers hit into the bushes and taking them out. So they, it was the night we were right near the, our house was close to the ninth tee and the ninth hole. And so we'd find the bushes off, you know, hit off the tee, get them out of the bushes, bring them over to the ninth tee and sell them to the golfers. Uh, so we had like zero cost of goods. Um, and we did sell lemonade along with the golf balls. So technically it was a, a, a both a beverage stand and a... Um, sports sports yeah. store uh, but great margins right and um, the only problem was that I was very allergic to poison ivy and so uh, that you know the the uh, I, every time a golf season came I would just get terrible cases of poison ivy but I still loved it it was really fun <laughs> so I know uh, you know I have kids right now yeah and uh, my wife she Buys honest tea and honest juice. kids. Kids, honest kids. For, yeah, honest yeah. kids, honest yeah. kids. So my question to you, because I wanted to ask the founder directly, yeah. are my kids okay? They're great. They're, They're they, going to yeah, be good. Can be better. It's amazing that product. <laughs> so honest kids started. So I have three sons. Uh, they are all out of the house now. In fact, my youngest is at Emory, which is in Atlanta, but I didn't get to see him today because of all the crazy. You got a star friend event. That's why. <laughs> um, so. We're selling Honest Tea, and uh, we've been doing it for eight years. And in 2006, my young, my middle son says, "Hey, Dad, I'm, I, was, I make lunch. Uh, so my wife makes dinner, but I make breakfast and lunch. And those, you know, those when the kids were growing up, that was easy because it was cereal and putting things in lunch boxes. And so I said, he said, Dad, how come you sell healthy drinks to grown-ups, but these drink pouches that you put in my lunch box are really sugary? And I was putting in the blue pouches that probably a lot of some folks here grew up on. And I looked at the pouch, and there was more sugar per ounce in a, a juice pouch, drink pouch, uh, than there is in a can of soda. And that's what I was putting in my son's lunchbox. And I said, wow, that's so obvious. We should come out with a kid's product, a drink pouch that is organic. And instead of having 100 calories per pouch, could have 40 calories per pouch. And Honest Kids now is actually larger in measure, all measured channels than Honest Tea. It is over $100 million annual sales. It is in Subway, uh, Chick Fil A, and Wendy's as right in the right in you know as a beverage option, um, and the whole category has shifted. If you go to a, you probably don't walk the juice aisles or the drink pouch aisles these days, but if you did, you'd see organic drink pouches from the blue folks. You'd see um, the calorie profile, which was at 100, is now more like at 60 uh, on average. Um, and we're still leading the, the growth in the category. So it's, it's, a, it's a, your kids are in great hands. The other thing that I'd mention is that when we started, we initially were just sweetening the drink with um, organic cane sugar. And when we partnered with Coca-Cola, 
we switched over the sweetener to organic fruit juice. So now when you read the ingredient, now what I would say as, as a nutritionist, the, the ingredient, the calories are the same, it's 40 calories either way, but the first ingredient instead of sugar is organic fruit juice. Um, so okay. really good. Cool. Yeah. Um, <coughs> So that's great. I got, finally got that out of the way because my because my my yeah. children didn't have a choice, <laughs> and like she's like my mom's like hey, you're gonna drink too. this. A lot you know? of parents drink yeah, it too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll actually will steal a couple of the juice packets myself. That's okay. Um, really quick hashtag startup grind at honesty yes. and at honest Seth. Thank you. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Do you have an Instagram handle? You know, my we were kids looking for do. that. Honesty does and Beyond Meat does. I don't personally have an Instagram. No Instagram. Yeah. Just oh. got into the Twitter thing recently, so yeah. I'm, I'm I'm sort of um, I'm not leading the. I'm leading well, when, you, on that. when you get a little cooler, you'll get an Instagram <laughs> account, right? Um, let's go start with the the beginning days of honesty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, this is really fascinating. Um, at the time, you had a wife and three kids. Yep. You knew nothing about tea. I was thirsty. Uh, that was that was my, when thinking that was my competitive when thinking, advantage. <laughs> well, I was gonna say when thinking back. <laughs> yeah. Do you think being naive was an advantage um, at the time? I I definitely yeah. I mean I I both my co-founder Barry, who was my professor from business school, and I went into this with no preconceived notions. All the, the only thing we knew was we we were thirsty, and the drinks that everyone was serving were just too sweet. How come it, somebody wasn't making uh, a drink that wasn't so sweet, and we couldn't be the only people who felt that way. There had to be somebody else <laughs> who shared that same thirst. And so um, we were willing to give it a try, and it was funny because we, we um, once we sort of got the idea, we then went to bottling plants to try to find, okay, we want to make this with real tea leaves. And we went to these bottling plants, and we'd sit down, and they we'd say, we want to make this with real tea leaves. And they'd say, well, you know, we normally use a powder or a syrup. And we said, no, we want to use real tea leaves. We want to brew them on site. And then, then they'd say, well, we want to use, we'd say, we want to use uh, organic sweeteners like organic honey, organic maple syrup, organic cane sugar. They said, well, normally we'll work with um, high fructose corn syrup, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make that work. And then we'd say, <laughs> this was true in the beginning. We said, we want to bring in spring water. We, we want to, we want to, they said, normally we use like a municipal source, but we'll, we'll do that. And then we said, we wanted a label that's on the front and back, like a wine label, to so sort of have a craft look to it. And by the end, they said, now, are you going to want 25 bottles in a case? I said, no, why would we do that? Because we don't do that either. I mean, every, everything we were asking was, you know, different than what they did. And, and over time, some of the things they asked for, like the front and back label, we realized were just too complex to really um, make sense. The spring water, we realized we could use, um, we could purify the water through filtration to give it the same properties as spring water and not have to worry about the spoilage if we if we weren't able to run right away. So some of the things we evolved, but by going in with like a totally fresh slate, um, we ended up with something actually was truly different. And I think that's certainly, hopefully one of the takeaways here is you can't just come into any competitive space and every space is competitive. You can't come in with something that's like 10% better or you know 10% different. We were going at a cat, so from a calorie perspective, everyone was at 100 and we started at 17 calories. So we were 83% <laughs> different, you know, there was an 83% difference between where the market was and what we were offering. So now all the stuff that you've know that you now know. Yeah. Like going up to the s success story that you've had. The question is would you have done it all over Absolutely. again the same way? You would the same way? Well, you know, look, I would have we made some bad decisions along the way. I went to made the bad decisions, but I, I don't I don't regret any of it. Um, it, it was. It's obviously been I intense, but it's been incredibly gratifying. And I think the thing I always stress to people is, if you believe in what you're doing, there's really no downside. I mean, it can be it can be hard. It may not work, but you've put it out there. You've 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 made an, an expression of yourself in the world, and that is it. I, that is its own reward. It's always better when it works out because then the impact lasts. But to feel like I believed in something and I took a stand and I acted on it. And I hopefully I brought other people along with me. And if you do it right, you're ha able to have an impact on all the people who have affected. So for us, as you said, billions of, of, of servings of honest tea sold. So we know all the people consuming our product are uh, can, you know, drinking organic products with lower calories. But we also know we look at our sourcing. And we uh, just last year, we bought over 18 million pounds of organic ingredients. And we know when we do that, the and fair trade ingredients, we have the impact on our sourcing communities where we're helping to help um, some of the poorest communities around the world gain um, economic self-sufficiency. And, and because it's organic and fair trade, they get a premium. They're able to, to, to earn and to be able to reinvest back in their communities. So 
um, when you can do it in a way that helps have these ripples that affect other people, that's there's, there's just not no downside to it. So I actually wanted to go into how you created your because your actual first prototype was f that's a funny story, right? Like you uh, you are sampling uh, your bottles, but is it true that you put it? I mean, you put it into Snapple bottles. So we, we made five thermoses of tea in our kitchen. And we took an empty Snapple bottle that we pasted a label on. Um, but the, when we got our first appointment at Whole Foods, we, the samples we poured were out of those thermoses. And the mock-up was an empty Snapple bottle with a label pasted on it. So we technically didn't serve out of the Snapple bottle. But we showed the buyer, this is what it's going to look like. And it was, a, it was I don't want to say it was a charade, but it was a <laughs> make-believe, right? We, we, it was, this is what we hope it's going to look like. We didn't lie to him. We didn't say, oh, yeah, we got it sitting in a warehouse. We said, this is what it's going to look like. And he said, "Great, I'll take fifteen thousand bottles." Okay, that's and that's what I'm yeah. saying. The fifteen thousand bottles. So and like, we had not made any more than what we had brewed in our kitchen. So that was a challenge. So yeah, creating fifteen thousand bottles <laughs> must have been a big challenge. Yeah, like, yeah, we had some work to do. How did you source? Do. Like, how did you create it? So we went to these different bottling plants. Uh, we went to um, you know beer packing plants, soda plants, jelly plants, and ended up at an apple juice plant up in Buffalo. We went to label supply. I mean, I hadn't. Um, so basically, it was it was the juggling plate. So okay, I got I got an order. Now I got to go find an investor. I could tell the investor, well, I got an order, so it's worth investing in. And then I could go to a bottle supplier and say, okay, I want to order bottles because I got I've got an order and I got an investor. And then I could go to the label supplier and say, well, I got the bottle, so I know what the size is, and so I've got the bottling plan and just putting it all together. And fortunately, none of the plates fell down before you know we were able to do our first production run. One of the, uh, I just want to share, because this, <laughs> I feel like you all have put in the hours here to, to, to wait for us. So I want to share a little more of the personal side of it, which was that, um, so literal. so I don't know the exact dates, but I know it was in March um, in 1998 that Barry and I were in my kitchen brewing the tea just before our Whole Foods date. And literally, while Barry's in my kitchen, while we're brewing tea, my wife walks in with that, my middle son, the same one who had the thirst for the honest kids, and my wife walks in, and she has this ashen look on her face. And I'm like, oh, she's probably upset. We've got teacups and beakers and um, Pyrex jars and boiling water and tea stains all over the place. Like, we're throwing the kitchen, you know. I said, oh, no, no, we're going to clean this up. And she said, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm like, oh, no, you know, what is it? And she had just come back, our son and her, who at the time was, um, he was just four years old. Um, had been diagnosed with a, a coarctation of the aorta, which means his aorta was closed off, and he was going to need major surgery, basically open heart surgery, um, uh, within the next four to six weeks. So, the day before the um, appointment with Whole Foods, and I've, I've left my other job, so there's no turning back, and so, you know, if that had happened maybe eight weeks prior. I might have said, hey, this is not the right time to launch this company, right? I've got to keep my health insurance. I've got to, you know, have more stability. Uh, I can take my leave from my other job. Um, but, you know, that's kind of what happens. Life, you know, the, you, you, you can't put life on hold to do this. This is, becomes part of your life. I couldn't put my son's <laughs> surgery on hold. I couldn't put honest, like, we either were going to launch or we weren't going to launch. So it was an incredibly intense uh, time. As, as you know now, of course, my son lived on to uh, come up with the idea for Honest Kids, and he, he actually now is a teacher in Chicago uh, with Teach for America, so, so well, that's we're still amazing. going. Actually, no, when you said Honest Kids, actually, I wanted to see, like, how did you come up with the name Honest T? <laughs> well, Honest T was Barry's name. He was Barry's so, name? Okay. So Barry um, had been in India, and he'd been doing a case study of the tea industry, and he was at an auction, and um, he was just hearing the word tea and playing around with it. And what's funny about it, there's a few funny things about it. So first of all, he was actually um, did some consulting for Tata, the big Indian conglomerate. Tata owned a lot of tea um, business in India, and they were trying to think about how to get to the United States. So Barry had come up with the name, Honest Tea. They said, thank you for the idea. We like the name Tata. They ended up actually buying Tetley, uh, and, and that became their brand to come to the United States with. Meanwhile, Barry said, well, I got this name if we ever need it. So when I reached out to him, he said, I got this name. And I'm like, that's an amazing name. Uh, and then we filed for the trademark in two different ways. We filed for honest T, the two, the two different words. But we also filed the, for the trademark H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A, all one word. And within a few weeks of that application, we heard back from Nestea's trademark lawyer who said, 
we've received your, we've seen your application to market this product called Ho Nesti, and we're not comfortable with that. <laughs> and uh, we said, wow, well, we're not comfortable marketing a product called Ho Nesti. <laughs> we will um, withdraw that application if you let us, you know, proceed with honesty. And, and so that was how we got the mark. <laughs> you know what? This is actually funny. So, like, you know, hey, you, 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 you owe it to the crowd. Have I, you? Is yeah. there? Is there? Is there a story, like any information, that you haven't shared ah. at other conferences, but you would like to share with this crowd? Think. You know anything? Uh, boy, you maybe know, we, we can, come, we can go there. around. We wrote a book um, uh, in 2013. That a comic book, in fact, yeah, about yeah. the story of honesty. We told a lot of the personal side of it, so I'm I'm pretty transparent. I haven't. Um, I will share with you, uh, this is relatively new, so I just last month sold my last uh, bit of equity and honesty. So we sold to Coke, Coke invested in 2008, and then in 2011, Coke had bought the rest of the company, but we arranged for a, a, an arrangement where I could still maintain most of my equity in the company. And then just, um, so here we are, so that was 2011, so in 2017, I just sold my last um, stake uh, in Honest Tea. And so now I'm still, you know, uh, involved. I'm still, you know, working half time with Honest Tea. But now my largest uh, stake as an investment is in this new company, Beyond Meat, where I'm executive chairman. Okay. And, uh, no, cause, cause, uh, because I was wondering, like, you know, when, I'm uh, obviously when, when Coca-Cola bought yeah. the company, yeah. you got Coke stock, right? No, no what no? we did was we... So Coke bought 40% of the company of Honest Tea. We, everyone got diluted. Uh, and then when they bought in 2011, I bought back in two, on, we, there was an entity. It was Honest Tea Inc., same entity, but the new shareholders. It was Co the Coca-Cola company and Seth Goldman. Yeah. And uh, the value of the company was based on the volume, the sales, the, 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 the revenue, the margin, the gross margin, and the operating income. Yeah. And we tracked it, and it it, it, was a, it was a good investment. I mean, it, it, it was a good investment beforehand, and just to share a few metrics, when, um, when, our in, when we started in 1998, we raised uh, $500,000 from our founding investors, which was, you know, <laughs> was me, my parents, Barry, Barry's parents, Barry's roommates from college, my sister. Those investors made 26 times their money, which is a good return. Um, and then uh, over time, you know, they, they bought it. Other investors came in, and you know, every, everyone made money. So not a, not of that magnitude. Um, yeah. So that was so how that worked. So the question is, you know, like um, now that they bought the rest of Honest Tea, yeah. Um, there's a lot of dry powder. So do you do yeah. you do a lot of angel investing? I um, I actually d I there's a lot of startups here in this room, <laughs> and they, they, they so didn't wait here yeah, this long. There you go. You guys you know? didn't wait long. I owe you. Um, so what I do is I, I um, almost exclusively will invest in companies that I'm involved in. Um, I do I invest in funds, but I have friends running those. So you know, um, but so my well, we don't care where the money comes from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my active uh, investments now are beyond me, where I'm chairman. There's another company called Ripple Foods, where I'm a board member, um, and the reason is because. Um, I certainly believe in the power and importance of food for change, for change in people's diets, for change in, in the in environment. And so, um, and I believe in, in branded food, meaning that's where my expertise is. So um, I'm not good at being a passive investor. I don't, I don't like to invest in things I don't know about. Yeah. I mean, it, that doesn't mean, as an investment strategy, yeah. that's whatever. I, I'm not giving investment advice, but just personally, I want to be invested in something that I can give advice on, and I want to work with people, in, in, in this case, entrepreneurs who are coachable, who take advice. And I've, I've met some great entrepreneurs, but who don't take advice, and, and I wish them well, and, and I don't, but I, don't, I won't get involved. So, the, so now that we're on the, the companies, because yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll go, I'm going to go back to the other, sure. other important stuff sure. Sure. for honesty, but yeah. for your, the companies that you work with, like, yeah. so Beyond Meat, yeah. obviously that's sort of like the plant-based um, meat alternative, yeah. right? And Anyone had a Beyond Burger here? Oh, nice, good work. What do you think? What do you yeah, it's pretty. They're awesome. Pretty amazing. Yeah, okay. it's 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 a transformational product. Well, um, I was gonna ask about that. Yeah, so, well, how yeah. do you see the future? Oh my gosh. Because because you know yeah. you got the McDonald's and the Wendy's oh, of the yeah. world, and so do you think <laughs> that they're gonna offer yeah. like a like a like a yeah. meat alternative? Right. So let me. If I, I don't want to get too uh, sermony here, but let me give you the big big picture, and then we can figure out wh where this all fits in. So the big picture is both the opportunity and the need for change, and the big picture is that when you look at all the health trends, the United States is in the wrong direction, fundamentally the wrong direction. So. 
Um, every five years, the United Nations tracks the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. Right, so there's about 200 countries in the world. In 2015 was when the latest rankings came out. So just keep in mind, the United States, wealthiest nation in the history of the world, more knowledge of science and medicine and nutrition than any civilization has ever had in history. In the rankings that came out in 2015, Japan was number one, Italy was number two, the United States was number 42. Like not top 10, not top 20, not top 30, number 42. So we literally have squandered our fortune. We are, you know, we are wealthy, we are wise from an intelligence perspective, but we're not healthy. And it is, it is shameful, uh, it shouldn't happen, but as an entrepreneur, it is a, just an amazing business opportunity to help the world's wealthiest nation with the most disposable income lead healthier lives. It's, I don't want to say it's, it's not a no-brainer, but it's so obvious this can be a place of impact and a place of opportunity. I, I come at it from a place of impact, but as a place of opportunity as well. And so we look at our, uh, and it's not just our food system. Obviously, when you have that, <laughs> when you're that low in the rankings, it's, it's lifestyle. It's our lack of connection to each other, our lack of connection to the natural world. Uh, it, it, it's so many things, but food is certainly one of those things. And so um, if we can change the food system, and, and when you look at where are the causes of, um, well, the biggest killer in the United States is heart disease. Um, and so certainly one of the main causes of heart disease is cholesterol. Um, if you can create a meat product that has no cholesterol but has all the other um, satisfying elements of meat, that could be a pretty powerful business. If you could, then you look at the environmental impact of the meat industry and you look at, um, there's countries in, the, in Europe where they've taxed the meat industry, the beef industry in this case, uh, because they say it has more, it creates more um, greenhouse gases than all forms of transportation combined. Mm -hmm. So if you can create a plant-based protein that is comparable to an animal-based protein, mm -hmm. Uh, but has none of that environmental impact, that could be very powerful. And so what Beyond Meat has done is um, focused really a very scientific approach, working with, we have 15 PhDs on staff, developing the science to perfectly replicate the texture and sensory experience of meat, in this case a hamburger. And it is unlike any, I've been a veg, my family's been vegetarian for 13 years. And I would say, we're not long suffering, we're proud and happy to be vegetarian, but we've never been satisfied with the options. If you were trying to dissuade people from being vegetarian, you could not do much better than creating the veggie burger. You, you know, as a tool to say, this is something you, you know, this is, there's pain and sacrifice involved here. It's just a terrible product. It's, it's a terrible category. And so um, to be able to make a product that was good enough to get carried in the meat section, at Whole Foods is, is a very high impact and uh, exciting opportunity. So um, can we get this meat yeah, off the website? Yeah, it's at Whole Foods. It's in, and it is often in the meat section, yeah. not, uh, not always in the meat section, but mostly in the meat section. Otherwise, it would be in the um, alternative meat section. But it's, it is just now rolling out. So we've just launched the burger. It's only in about 400 stores. Um, all the Whole Foods in the Mid-Atlantic have it. Uh, over the next few months, it'll be expanding to lots of other stores. We'll be releasing those names in the in the months to come but um really exciting uh, and fun business to be part of it and honest tea I, I i love i'm still obviously very close to it but honest tea was a 19-year marathon to build it to what it is um, beyond meat has been in business since 2009 this burger has been on the market for less than a year but i'm willing to believe that this will accelerate in growth um, more quickly, just because of the category, because of the, the, the disruptive nature of the product. I mean, honesty was great, but it wasn't, and it still is great, <laughs> but it's, it, 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 it was certainly very different from the products on the shelf, but it took time to build people's appetite for it. We know with this burger, when people taste it, we can, we're not gonna make everyone a vegetarian, but we will absolutely increase the number of plant-based meals mm -hmm. that people have. Okay, so you, so you heard it here. Yeah, this is going to be bigger than honest tea. Um, that's that's kind of well, like what you're saying. I, I don't want to be on the record saying Cause that because that's tweetable. I, well, because right honest tea, honest tea is uh, honest tea is is getting bigger. I mean, we're, we're our our revenue numbers are quite a bit larger than you were, you had mentioned, and we're now growing to Europe. Um, we've got some incredible growth opportunities. We're just launching a drink called Honest Sport, which is like re organic. organic sports drink. It's just. <laughs> ridiculously obvious that, and I, I'm embarrassed that I missed it, but it's now that it's out there, it's like, oh, this is, this is a great product. So Honest Tea is, is big and powerful, and, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, Beyond Meat will, uh, will, will become a powerful 
uh, engine of change, and I'm excited about it as well. Are you looking I for did, I didn't know. I, did, I, 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 I didn't imagine that I could get as proud and excited about a, an enterprise that I hadn't created, but I am uh, absolutely as, as excited. Are you looking for jobs? Is it beyond me? Um, yes, it's out what in California. Um, we're hiring salespeople for sure. Okay. Um, and there are some marketing jobs that come along as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm not making the hiring, but I'm happy to connect people to the folks who are. Sure, okay. <laughs> Hashtag startup grind at honesty <laughs> at honest Seth. Okay. Um, so I wanted to go, let's, let's go back to this, because I, I think this is a very important topic. Yeah. Uh, in fact, this is the kind of, this topic, this, no, this topic here that I'm uh, yeah. about to ask yeah. is probably the number one topic that all of our startup grind here yeah. in DC have always been asking. Okay. And it's really the, the topic of culture. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. <clears throat> how important is culture, right, to a company? Like, do you <laughs> yeah. think that if you... Explain to us like what an honesty culture. What yeah. is culture? How does that define so, honesty? So for all of these businesses, whether it's honesty, Beyond Meat, or Ripple, we talk about these as mission-based businesses. These are businesses where the mission drives what we do. It drives how we think, the decisions we make, and, and, and it drives the people we attract, and that in turn drives the culture. So uh, the mission for honesty obviously was a lower calorie, organic, and then fair trade product. Right. The mission for Beyond Meat is plant-based protein. Uh, at Ripple, it is plant-based dairy. Um, and you attract certain people for that type of work. Now, accounting or even operations may not, you know, at Beyond Meat, they're not all vegetarian, but they obviously have to be open to that. Um, and we certainly disproportionately attack people who are either vegetarian or, you know, a very animal um, rights focused. They also have to have great skills, but when you can get people who um, are excited about what they're doing and, and, and the cause that they're involved in, that um, becomes, creates loyalty, it creates excitement, and it drives your culture. It, it's funny, I was on a panel uh, two weeks ago about Beyond Meat with a bunch of animal rights <laughs> activists, and one of them said, I have job envy. Like, you know, she's been working to help make farmers more compassionate in the way they raise and slaughter animals. She says, like, I'm just sort of making things less bad. You're making things more good. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's fun to feel like, and I do feel, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I came at Honesty from a nonprofit mindset because I'd been in the nonprofit sector. Yeah. And fortunately, um, that made it easier for me during the first 10 years when we were a nonprofit. You know, <laughs> not, not, by, not by design, but, you know, that was just the way we were building the business. And so um, that's a really good question when you think about culture. Is this, is the mission and charter of this organization so compelling that you could be happy working for this organization even if it were, were a nonprofit? You know, and, and for, for honesty, if it meant I was working for a nonprofit that was helping to eliminate millions of cal billions of calories from the American diet or helping to promote organic agriculture or helping to promote fair trade labor standards in the developing world, that would have been a, I would have been happy to be part of that nonprofit. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think that for us is, is really a key. So, so Coca-Cola bought you guys. Right. You guys are honesty. I feel like there's two big uh, there's a big gap in culture. So could you so tell yeah. us like how did you adapt yeah. to yeah. a bigger company so, and their culture? So part of it was in the beginning. There there was um, and what we did the way we structured the deal. And this I I'm glad we did it. I I didn't know how important it would be at the time. But we said at first Coke when Coke bought forty percent of the company, they were a minority owner. So even if Coke had wanted to tell us to do something, and occasionally they did. <laughs> We just said, no, you know, thank you for your opinion, and just like every shareholder, we'll listen, but we're not going to necessarily follow your advice. And that was really important. And over those next three years, we grew the company. We basically grew about three threefold from their investment. So they said, okay, well, look, you may not do everything we agree with, but they're growing this company with integrity and, 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 and robustly. We're now 10 times larger than we were when Coca-Cola first invested. Uh, still growing with integrity, still growing very quickly, very certainly one of the fastest growing brands, not just in the beverage space, but within Coca-Cola's portfolio too, and not to mention the global opportunities. So uh, because we've been able to grow that way, they have, there's been no effort to compromise the ingredients, to, to try to find shortcuts. Just um, So when we started, we were organic tea. Uh, we were only about 40% fair trade tea. Um, since Coke bought the company, we've moved everything to fair trade tea. And just last year, we moved everything to fair trade sugar. And we wouldn't have been able to make that move without, you know, um, Coke scale and support. So um, I feel like the brand is more honest than it was back in the day. 
uh, but the scale is different. So back to fair trade, like I know yeah. what it means, but can you explain to the audience sure, what sure. fair, so fair trade means? Um, we buy, uh, I- every time we buy a pound of either sugar or tea leaves, a portion of the sales goes back to the supplier community. And it doesn't go to the people who own the farm, it goes to a council of the workers. So uh, you look at a tea garden, 60 to 70 percent of the workforce is the women who pick the tea leaves in the fields. This is in India and China. Um, 20 to 30 percent of the of it are the usually men who work in the factories handling the drying equipment and the loading equipment. The money goes to this count. The council is comprised. It reflects the workforce. So there's going to be more women, and it so it actually is an economic empowerment um, arrangement for women because it gives them a chance that they don't have in these communities often to be able to say, how are we going to spend our community wealth, the, the, the proceeds of our work? And so they're able to invest it in everything from um, health care to schools to a micro enterprise fund. We, um, in Paraguay, where we buy fair trade sugar, there's no safety net. And so the cooperative invests a lot of the money in providing homes for the elder members of this cooperative who, you know, literally uh, in some cases live in, you know, s- uh, mud, sticks and mud huts. Um, we've also invested, th- our fair trade funds have been used to invest in ambulances uh, because they're often not left a- lack access to health care. But also, um, we in India, northern India, Assam, we have um, brought in eye doctors because these, uh, f- the folks in these communities just don't have access to eye care. And so we brought in uh, a team of eye doctors um, and had 5,000 people who got, uh, you know, eye do- whether they needed glasses, which obviously <laughs> is connected to literacy, or to picking better tea leaves, um, or they had treatment for uh, cataracts, all types of things. So it's, it is it, w- one of the important el- um, concepts of fair trade is that the recognition, we don't know what's best for these communities. We know that uh, we can... Um, Bring share wealth with them, and they can choose how to invest it in, in the way that makes sense to them. So it's kind of like a triple bottom line, right? <laughs> you know, I, I always avoid that term, but but I because for oh, me there triple is bottom a, line. How about well, that? I no. think you have a bottom line. You have to build a business, and it has to be a, 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 a financially successful business. And if you do it right, and you and it is your mission is 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 brewed into the concept of the business, then um, you have the opportunity to do positive things with it. Um, but I, I, I it's not that I. I don't use that term, but I I, okay. I understand the term. Fair enough, fair yeah. enough. So I'm going to ask one last set of questions. Yeah. And just to be fair for the audience, I'll let them ask questions. Uh, and I'm Hopefully stay, they're not going to be angry. Right? Night. <laughs> no, like, I feel so bad for I wanna, coming I late. I want so, to yeah. open up to sure. the audience because I think to. it's fair for them. So yeah. prepare your you questions. Guys, whatever you want. Okay, like anything, <laughs> ask anything, AMA. Yeah. So uh, my, my last question, and I'm going to ask another question afterwards, but <clears throat> what is your favorite flavor? <laughs> Um, so I gotta say the um, honest sports really fun right now. I'm yeah. really enjoying it. My um, the favorite flavor that I'm really into right now is ginger oasis. It's an unsweetened ginger herbal tea. It's in a glass bottle. It's at Whole Foods. Anyone had it? People got to try it. It's it's like it's it's not always in the cooler, so it may be on the dry shelf. But it's just so it's no calories, but it's incredibly flavorful because it's just ginger. Uh, and there's some herbal tea, but Kay. that's really neat. Um, I also love our Tulsi, which is a Tulsi is a basil leaf that we brew. It's also okay. an herbal tea. Okay. Um, but Honest Sport is is okay. um, something I'm especially excited about. So what's your worst flavor? Well, we've just continued our worst flavors, uh, and we've had some bad ones. This okay, like what? We had a vanilla mint uh, white tea that really tasted like toothpaste. That, <laughs> would, that didn't work. We had a whole line called Coco Nova, okay. which was a brewed cacao drink. Um, that was really unusual. Uh, just it, and, yeah. and it, it, um, I kind of thought it was interesting. It just it didn't work. Um, so, so you know, you you try a lot. We tried a lot. So what what is the one flavor you wanted to make but you didn't have the courage to make? Oh, you know, I, I really think it, if I've wanted to make it, I, I've made it. You know, Barry, sriracha. Barry wanted sriracha? us. Barry wanted us to make a barley tea. Um, oh, and I just thought, yeah, that's it, Korean, by the way. It is Korean. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It, it's you tough. Make it? It's tough. It's tough to make it cold and to make it taste good. It uh, tastes but good it, without a lot of. I say good without a lot of sweetener. Good without a lot of sweetener. Oh, okay, got yeah, it. So, uh, got but it. we might come back to it. Um, Let me know if you need some help with I that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Really? No, we've we have gone after a lot. I mean, obviously, you put as uh, as much out there. You've got to have a lot of ones that don't work too. Sure. Sure. 
Okay, so another part of the of the bottle. Yeah. Uh, how did you come up with the the quotes oh, up on the, the cap? Quotes. How did that How did that happen? So I think that goes back to um, when I was growing up. There were Salada tea bags, and the Salada tea bags used to have little quotes on the tags. And then I thought, wow, that's such a neat um, way to, to. It's like a totally different benefit of a product, right? You're drinking tea, um, but for us, I it's a, a lot like uh, you know Cracker Jack is the the little toy prize inside has gone downhill so much. There's no you don't get any more tattoos or little like mazes. They're just like I don't know what they are. But so this is like our our Cracker Jack. This is like our our prize under the um, inside, and they're really they're fun and they're meaningful and they hit people at different points in life where you're like, wow, th mm -hmm. this is a real experience. And I've seen artwork with the caps. And uh, by the way, on the on the um, pet bottle, the plastic bottle, there's qu quotes on the inside of the label. Um, so um, we love sharing those ideas there. So what's your favorite oh, quote? I have so many. OK, so your top three. Top three. So one is the Chinese proverb. I, I kind of referred to it where I said, if we don't change the direction we're going, we will end up where we are headed, right? So that speaks to this whole health phenomenon. That's if we're tweetable. going in the wrong direction. Um, and and it's and it's certainly the case when we think about um, business as well. The one that is on our wall in uh, Bethesda is those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. So you walk into our office and that's the first thing you see, and that really is the mindset we have, which is uh, yeah, of course we shouldn't be marketing <laughs> a low calorie tea, organic, all those things, and and we are. Um, and then the other one is one I saw when I was growing up in Wellesley. Saturday morning cartoon, it was um, um, Fat Albert, and uh, it was actually a Bill Cosby sort of being the narrator there, and he said, he who throws mud only loses ground. And so I, I'd like to think that is part of my mindset as well. So it's very easy to um, try to raise yourself up by uh, throwing mud at others, and hopefully that's not something I do. Okay, cool. Um, before I open up the, yeah. the floor, um, is there something specific you wish a startup could create to help <laughs> honesty? Everybody, so write your notes. So th yeah. That could create it. Say, finish the question. Yeah, the yeah like, like there's a, there's a you wish that a startup created could create it for you, and then you might be able to buy them oh. for a startup, honesty or invest. Uh, you know, I I'm I'm too close to it because if there's something I believe in, I'm a, I'm doing You're gonna it. You're going to do it? Yeah. So that's the sports drink as an example, Beyond Meat as an example. I just tasted a uh, product over the weekend um, by a friend who's launching a company that is a this, – this would be – if I weren't doing anything else, this would be a good one. Kay. It is the idea of sort of the morning um, – it's overnight oats, so everybody be familiar with that, but on the go with um, nuts and chia seed and some fruit, and it's like – it's a portable breakfast that is nourishing, has fiber, um, tastes good, and is sticks to your ribs. Um, so rarely do you get all of those. <laughs> you can usually get two out of three, but to get that, um, so I've, that's probably one that we are we're gonna invest in, and and and, and it's a, like I say, it's a friend of mine, so um, support. Awesome. But okay, yeah. okay, yeah. I'm gonna open up questions, and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna get somebody who looks really bored. Oh. <laughs> okay, so now everyone's like, whoa, wait, I'm worried about that. <laughs> you have a question? Just gonna grab my <laughs> All right, who have a question? All right, who's really excited to No, <laughs> Frank, I can't, no, he's going to ask a really long question. I'll do you later. All right, I'll, let me do the female first, okay, because there's too many guys here. Oh, thank you. Hi, Seth, um, my name's Mai Sagawa. Hi. I'm from Bethesda, Maryland. Nice. Actually, um, my parents own a Japanese restaurant right one block away from yours, it's called Taco Grill. Oh yeah! I'm in the sake and sushi industry. Very nice. Um, thank you. Um, my question to you would be, I read your business plan online, your yeah. original business it's plan. Yeah, it's on. It's online. Yeah. Yes, and um, I'm I'm guessing that that business plan was written after you've had a lot of success because I saw like all the tes testimonials and everything. Mm. Um, that was not like that was like 1999, 1999 or 2000, so it was still early. I mean, we got a good response okay. uh, when we started, but it was still early. Okay. Um, my question to you would be, um, when you said that you were talking with investors, yeah. Um, if you're developing, for example, like a product for tea or for sake, w where do you look for these investors? <laughs> I don't know if that's a legitimate yeah, question. Yeah, it but sure it is. It's very relevant. So, um, and just to, to help distinguish, Honest Tea was funded by angel investors exclusively. We raised, over the first 10 years, we raised $10 million. Uh, and it, so obviously averaged out to about a million dollars a year. So it wasn't 
always that way. But that was roughly what we did. And um, the first round of investors, as I said, was only friends and family, only people who we could lose their money and still get invited back for Thanksgiving, right? Um, the next round really was, and that was the hardest round because we were going to people we didn't know, and um, it was from people who liked the product. And so we would get emails from people who said, I like this product, can I invest? There'd be an article, uh, there was an article in the Washington Post in around 2000 talking about the company. It mentioned we were raising money, and that created a whole lot of incoming interest. You know. Yeah, yeah. So I think when you have the chance, and everyone has a chance to talk social media, you don't want to put it out like we're desperate, we need money, but to mention we are trying to grow and expand and we need capital for growth. So, so for us, it, um, we that that first round we raised, that we raised $1.2 million in 1999, that was easily the most labor intensive. I was spending at least 50% of my time just raising money. But it laid the, the base and then once that was done, every year got progressively easier because either those investors would invest more, they like what they were seeing, or we, their friends wanted to come in as well. And I would say there's a few key principles that we applied, we still apply, and I brought them to Beyond Meat as well. So number one, always communicate with your investors. So every quarter, send out a communications. Good, bad news, whatever it is, be transparent. You don't come to them only when you need money. And I've, I've, I've been invested in companies where that's the case, and it's like, you know, you didn't, you didn't help me along to see how you got to this point. It's too, if, if you're in a bad state now, it's too late. And we certainly had challenging moments along the way, but we kept holding their hands as we did. The other one is um, to be accessible, uh, always return the calls, but also don't be, um, <laughs> sort of make sure the investors understand, not the ground rules, but what they're, what's going on. Like, okay, I'm, I'm building this business and I have to, if I have to talk to you every month about what's going on, that's not good for you or me because we're not building the business. So we always had an annual shareholder call where everyone could get an update and hear what's going on. But other than that, it was those quarterly updates. That's how they got their, their news. And uh, just to build on that, Beyond Meat's a very different model. So I mentioned Honest Tea had raised $10 million over 10 years. Beyond Meat has raised $100 million over five years. Um, so much more capital intensive. Once again, much larger prize, um, but much more capital needed to scale the business. Did you raise money from the West Coast? Yeah, well, uh, so Beyond Meat, absolutely. Honest Tea, Mm, not much. It was pretty, you know, because we started here in the Mid-Atlantic, so it was, it was, um, we were raising from a lot of people like real estate investors who wanted to diversify. <laughs> um, our challenge was we raised, you know, during 1999 and 2000 was during, during the whole dot-com boom. So people were throwing millions of dollars at these dot-coms, and we were like a, you know, a bricks and mortar, uh, bottles and tea, caps, and um, it was harder to raise money. But, um, so it definitely took some time. Next question. Hey, how you doing? I'm Good. John Wise from Bethesda originally, now awesome. in Loudoun County. Um, I, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of a startup, a tech startup here in the area. And I've got the scariest time now that I'm heading into. I've got rapid growth that I just don't know what to do with. Um, it's a little bit of a longer discussion, but we do invention, <laughs> patent, and product mapping. Nice. Um, yeah, in a nutshell, we're, we're literally mapping out the sum of mankind's knowledge. And wow. we'll have that done in about a, a year. That's a big project. It's <laughs> It's smaller than you would expect, <laughs> actually. Um, it's something we can have done in the next six months. So wow. it's not as large as yeah. one should expect. Huh. But so I wanted to ask advice for rapid growth. I mean, I, I'm dealing yeah. with going from pre-sales yeah. to potentially 400 million this year. Yeah. And I have no way of handling that scale yeah. of growth. Yeah. So the first thing is to enjoy it. Like it. it <laughs> No, it really is. A, there's a mindset you can have. So one of the most important lessons I learned, I was in, a, um, before I uh, got into any of this, um, it was in 1988. I was, so I had just graduated from college. I had already traveled overseas for a, a year. But then I was working on the Dukakis Benson campaign. I was doing advance work. And I was setting up events for Lloyd Benson when he would go to a campaign event. And um, the first few events, I was just running around, I was sweating, I was tense, because it was high stakes, the national media's there, you don't want to screw up. Um, and a friend of mine said to me, after one of the events, everything went well, he said, you know, you did great, but you could have done what you did just as well and enjoyed it. <laughs> like, just, just like, you know, it doesn't mean you don't run when something needs to get done quickly, but just, 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 just enjoy it. And I was like, what? 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 <laughs> but they was right. Mm -hmm. Like everything I did, I was like, 
I and and as a result, I was just it was just that little just like a shift. It was like changing from you know hot air you know to whatever. I mean, um, and so when you go through this all, it's crazy. It's intense, but it doesn't happen all the time. And you've worked hard to get to this point. And this is the this is kind of the moment you've been waiting for, hoping for. And so make sure to like take it all in. It doesn't mean bad things don't happen, but like literally just. Like, wow, this is amazing. So in addition to that, make sure you also are able to, to keep balance, right? You've got to be able to have um, balance in all, uh, physical balance, so you can't work 20 hours. You've got to find outlets, physical outlets or family outlets or uh, other things to help give you perspective. You get too wound up in what you're doing, you won't be able to, to be effective at what you're doing. Um, you got to have great people you're with who you can delegate to, and, and you have to empower them. And of course, any good entrepreneur thinks that we always think we can do it best, uh, but we, we, it's, it's physically impossible to do every aspect of it the best, so you've got to be able to hire people and empower them to do that. Um, and if you have great people, then it's not hard to do. Um, so those are some of the key things I would say. Okay. I want to get questions from Foodsy Startup. So uh, <laughs> anybody had? Okay, there's there one. Go. Okay, this is a, you have a question? Okay, these are all the food startups. Awesome, awesome. All right, so what I want you to yeah. do is I want you to tell what your startup do, does and then ask your question. Hi, my name is Vanessa, and I own a food tech startup. It's called Greenies. It connects consumers to restaurants that are buying local. Nice. The entire idea is to learn yeah. about where your food comes from when yeah. you go out to eat. I'm having the same problem where a lot of people are telling me, you need to fundraise on the West Coast, right? Because <laughs> oh, everybody out silly. there loves yeah. the idea. But how to kind of tap into these investors? Yeah. Because I feel it's about who you know. You get an introduction, an introduction. That's how we got accepted into an accelerator program that we got into. Yeah. But how do you make that first <laughs> connection without so really just yeah. inundating people on LinkedIn? I know? literally didn't know anybody in the food business when I launched this. Um, so now it took me as I said, 10 years to raise that $10 million. Um, but I, you definitely don't need to go to the West Coast to raise this. This, In fact, it's more expensive on the West Coast um, because, you know, the, they, the, it, the valuations are higher, and, and so you're, you know, you're just looking at raising more money. Um, <laughs> if you're doing it right, I think it's much better to have discipline and raise less money. Um, so uh, it was a healthy discipline. We had it on us, T, where we only, you know, would have a million dollars to sort of any... Either way, we were going to make mistakes. We just try to make less expensive mistakes. So um, certainly, if you have existing customers, that's a great way to be able to, if they become believers in what you're doing, that's a great way to be involved. You're dealing with a lot of restaurants. Um, hopefully, some of those restaurants are being successful, and those people become believers in what you're doing. It's always going to be the people who are believers in, in your cause. I mean, it's funny. I, I talk with charities a lot. I was, with a, I was talking to a charity earlier this month last month, um, and, and it's, they focus on legal aid, they focus on you know, using um, the law to help protect communities. And he was talking to me, because he appreciated the social entrepreneurship aspect. I said, I love the cause, I love what you're doing. I said, but you should be raising money from lawyers. They relate to this, and with your business, I, I would think that's the circle, not lawyers, but the, people, <laughs> the circle of people who identify with what you're doing and find it meaningful and impactful. We, you know what's neat about Beyond Meat is we've raised money from uh, the Humane Society, We've raised money from um, other animal rights activists. Now, we've also raised money from Kleiner Perkins and Bill Gates and the founders of Twitter. Um, uh, but, you know, there's others who very feel very cause-related in the investment, too. So here's another Foodsy startup. Great. Um, she got recently um, featured at uh, DCNO. So please talk about your startup and then your question. Oh, thanks. I was going to lead with Go Emery. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, first, so my company is Plum Relish. We do fast casual for the workday. So we're competing. And what's it, what's it called? Plum Relish. Plum Relish, okay. So we are compete against Panera, Cozy, Corner Bakery for just corporate lunch. Oh. So we do plant-based, yeah. gluten-free. Nice. Um, and we're B2B. We're a startup. We've done about 60,000 lunches in 18 months. Oh. And my question for you is, all things being equal, if you had started Honest Tea now, knowing the funding market, what would you have done differently? Because I feel like for investors, they have greater access. Yeah. It's, they want to throw money into a tech startup or a business that has, you know, sound unit economics. The, the there's different optionality there. So it's funny because Honest Sport, and I, I apologize that you can't see the liquid, but this is the Honest Sport bottle. We're we're launching this as a startup. I basically said, okay, let's, you know, we've got a bigger business, but I want to I want to create a, a, a new an extension of our brand 
that we can um, grow uh, in an entrepreneurial way, not part of the large Coke portfolio. And so I have uh, the ability to access much larger resources now that we're part of Coca-Cola. I said, I, I, want, I want to start with $200,000. I want to just, you know, which is less than I started Honest Tea with. I want to just get this into market, and I want to start testing it and probing it. So it, it actually, what I, um, because the thing I think that's key, and this is, at least in the food business, I don't know enough about um, other non-food businesses, but you have to appreciate that whatever you launch first in the food business is not going to be the product that gets you across the finish line. You know, I'm friendly with the guys who launched vitamin water. And for the first five years, they had go-go energy drink and soy water and fruit water and all these other things that, you know, just didn't hit. I was on the board of a company called Happy Baby, uh, organic baby food. Their first products were in the freezer. And it wasn't until they went to the pouches that they grew and got acquired by Danone. So um, you don't want to put too much money up front in a, behind an idea that isn't proven. Once you get traction, then you take on more money. So. I actually don't think I would have changed the way I raised the money. And I think you can always feel the competition's there and the marketplace is heating up, blah, blah, blah. That's always going to be the case. Um, you you want to build the business in a way that um, is proven, that works. Once you get that, it's easy to raise the money. You know, and that's for, for Beyond Meat, we've raised money. But um, this burger, it's a totally different concept now when we raise money because people have seen that, in fact, we just took in money at Beyond Meat. We just raised money from Tyson as their first plant-based protein investment and because they tasted the burger and they're like that's ridiculous like that's not that that is not a veggie burger that's a different idea okay so you had vanessa who was the no she just pitched her as that's the yelp for vegetarians um sarah is the catering yeah and then these guys we actually had um this is commonwealth joe they do um we actually did a marriott demo day and they came out there went to marriott headquarter and they had the chilled coffee. So I wanted nice. you to talk about um, mm -hmm. Commonwealth Joe and what's your yeah. question. Oh, yeah. So thanks so much for being here. Sure. Seth. sure. Um, so we're a coffee company. Uh, we've been roasting for about 12 years. Wow. Under the name of Commonwealth Joe since 2012. Um, so we're a roaster. We're a retailer. We have two shops. We do some uh, sales with Whole Foods and other grocers nice. in the area. Yeah. Um, Multi-channel business, somewhat vertically integrated, but um, you know, one part of the business that's been growing really quickly for us is nitro cold brew. Yes. We also do some experimentation with Cascara, uh, yep. which we're thinking about putting in kegs and yeah. you know, under uh, under nitro, and then also under CO2 for sparkling Cascara. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, anyway, it's like there's a lot of different pieces. <laughs> it's hard to, to be go. focused. Yeah. Um, but my question for you was, you know, how uh, as you were growing Honest Tea um, at the beginning, it was all about uh, product development. It was all about getting some traction, getting those initial investors. Right. Then maybe about, um, and it's similar for us, and then it's all about, um, e e um, you know, increasing your production. What I'm wondering is, when, when, when did you really start focusing on um, taking your brand to the next level, hiring full-time yeah. marketing people, and how did you think about evolving your marketing organization and how much to spend on that part of your business? Yeah. Um, boy, the first, uh, really the first six years, <laughs> we were just focused on survival. So we were doing things like, we had a bottling plant that was just a disaster. We owned a third of a bottling plant, and it was doing, it, I was dry, it was outside of Pittsburgh. I was driving there every other week, getting up at like 2 in the morning to get there by 6, driving home at 4 to get home by 8, uh, not to mention the strain on my family, just physically. And every, you know, basically that would take me off for the week because I'd be so exhausted. And it meant I wasn't focusing on the, building the brand. I was like just focused on survival. And it wasn't until we got rid of that plant that I'm like, all right, <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. All that energy and stress I was putting into something that wasn't building our brand, I could then direct on it. You know, we still, our brand, um, I don't want to make it sound like we had a bunch of brand managers. We were always, our marketing was always demos. That was, for us was our, our, that was our marketing, which was just getting it in the product, of let people sample it and taste it. That was where we put our emphasis on it. And then finding, um, you know, using public relations to tell our story, um, finding authentic ways to connect with consumers. We weren't running big ad campaigns. I mean, we do now because we have the resources and we have the scale. Um, but um, we were always wanting to just continue to build the brand and build the sales, just focused on. Uh, and w when we found something that clicked, we would you know, go deeper on it. So I want to do a little shout out. Doran here, she's actually the owner of Sticky Finger Oh, nice, Bakery. nice. <laughs> so she was on the yeah. uh, cake, Cupcake Wars. Absolutely, yeah. Nice. And uh, Marley. Uh, awesome. She didn't yeah, have a question. Say. I've been trying to get it. Uh, she's like, I don't even know. I have no question. All right. She didn't even take me all the information. you have a question? <laughs> she is the new host of Beyond the Kitchen and is a, and an actor in that work. 
Oh, neat. Because we would love for you to be our first episode. Oh, very fun. Very okay. fun. All right, that wasn't a question. <laughs> okay. Sign me up. All right. Sign um, me up. Marley, you have a question? Have a question? Sure. Okay. So, Marley, she's an ink contributor. Oh. <laughs> be careful what you say. <laughs> no, off the record right now. Um, I have a question about Beyond Meat. Actually. Yeah. And so, since we're in DC, found it fitting. Okay, so with meat, like most consumers, we don't really know what's in meat anyway. Yeah. I actually stopped eating meat two years ago. Just I yeah. lived in England, and their meat just very different from the U.S. Yeah. The U.S. has a lot different. Yep. <laughs> the yep. laws and the policymakers and all that stuff. Yeah. You see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is, and I don't even know if you could answer this. I'll try. But is it possible, maybe down the road, to get beyond meat? as meat and not tell consumers? So, so here's, that yeah, no, that's a, a, it's a really problems. interesting question. It, I mean, we, would, we would never, uh, <laughs> from a, just transparency, we'll always we'll, we'll want to disclose it's plant protein, but the big picture, the, 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 the destination we are working toward is transforming the meat counter into the protein counter. So it's no longer just hamburger, chicken breast, turkey breast, it's chicken protein, plant protein, beef protein, uh, turkey protein, and it's, an, it's a continuum. And the point is that now people start to wreck If it's burger night, maybe some, you know, it's burger night. I'll buy two beef burgers and I'll buy two Beyond Burgers. That's, that's an okay outcome. I think one of the challenges in the, <laughs> we say that one of the biggest impediments to making the world vegan are vegans because <laughs> they often are so um, self-righteous. And, and it's, I, 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 have, I've said, I've been vegetarian for 13 years, so they have a very um, strongly held views, which I deeply respect. But I, I also recognize that if I want to bring people to this point of view, I can't, it can't be a purist point of view. And so there's two different ways to think about how do we um, double the number of uh, vegetarians and vegans in the population. There's only about 5% of the population is vegan and vegetarian. And unfortunately, it's, it's been that way for decades. So there's a lot of churn. In college, people become vegetarian, and then they'll move out because they get hungry, or they say the stuff isn't, doesn't taste good. Um, but if we can get every American family to have one more plant-based meal, that's one meal out of 21 meals a week. One out of 21 is almost 5% and you've effectively doubled the number of vegetarians in the population um, just by making a product that has the taste and satisfying elements of beef. It's a little trickery there, huh? <laughs> it's, it's the same impact, right? So I, 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 one of the guideposts I always have, and this is whether it's thinking about Coca-Cola as an investor or Tyson as an investor, um, my North Star is the impact. And I'm always going to think about what is going to lead to the change that I want to make happen. And, and so for Honest Tea, when we were small, you know, there were some people who said, in fact, my dad, I don't want you to sell. I don't want you to lose what you're doing. And I said, Dad, I, I love what I'm doing, but what we've got is a model for change. We're not a change driver. Mm -hmm. When we are in 15,000 accounts, that's mostly on the coast, mostly in healthy food stores, we're not democratizing organics. Mm -hmm. And now we're in over 130,000 stores, and we're reaching people you know, in places where people don't go to buy organic or go to buy lower calorie drinks, and, and we're right in there in the consideration set. So we're, we ran out of time. Um, and I want to apologize again. I want to no, thank no, but you wait, all I for have coming. A, I have a question, okay, though. I still yeah, have two questions left because I'm sure the host. I just people right? hear me apologize. <laughs> I, yeah. So here, I got two last questions. Sure. So one, if you could turn back time 15 years ago. 19 years ago. Okay, 19 years ago, <laughs> sorry. Um, what would be the single most important piece of advice you would have given yourself? <laughs> I would have said, don't buy a bottling plant. Um, <laughs> other than that, I, you know, I, I have enjoyed the ride. I have enjoyed the work. I have, I, I'm not one of those people who's going to say, I, I wish I had gotten to more baseball games. I, I coach my son's baseball team. So, like, I, you know, I made that time. Um, I, I, I um, absolutely always ran the business in the way that I believed. There were, there were decisions where we couldn't go fair trade right away, and that was, it wasn't frustrating. I just said it's, 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 an, it's a long arc, and we are, we're, are <laughs> we're on that arc, and we're not there yet. So, um, but, it, but I, you know, we're not gonna do something I don't believe in. Um, so, I, I don't have a really good answer to that. Okay, yeah. I mean, you can tweet it out later, and we'll just retweet <laughs> it. But the other piece of advice, yeah. and this is another reason I've worked out well for me, I, um, I live near where I work. And I know that sounds silly or, or trivial, but like 
means that I never was just stuck in traffic, like um, worrying about things I couldn't control. Like I have a, I have a, it's a mile bike ride to my office, um, and it's actually the uh, in in California it's about with Beyond Meat it's about a four mile bike ride. But like, I I get to work and I'm thankful that I have had had such a short commute instead of like getting out of the car and saying like oh I just had the life sucked out of me now I have to go run a f you know a full time day. So um, and that you, you know just going back to why are we still living in the house we're still living in. Um, First of all, it's, it's, we love it, and it's a fun, it's a wonderful place. But it's also close to work, and um, for me, I would much rather um, be able to have all that time, which over the over the course of 19 years, literally, probably is a few years of time I've been able to enjoy with my family instead of sitting in traffic, you know, putting out emissions and just, you know, creating more tension. Um, so, last question, but yeah. before last question, are you gonna, you gonna, you're planning on staying in your house? Oh yeah, so here's the thing about that. Like we, we were, here's the, the most important equation. Uh, this is my secret formula for life. Okay. The happy, it's, it's, it's just a mathematical equation and it's happiness is, uh, or, or happiness equals uh, what you want is greater than what you need. All right, so remember, what you want is greater than what you need. Most people think that to be happy, you need to have more. But the also a way to be happy is to need less. And if you need less, if you're happy with what you have, then you're happy. And we were happy before we launched Honesty, and we were living, uh, when, I, when, I <laughs> when I launched Honesty was easily our lowest uh, point of income, and I'll share the numbers. This was in 1998 dollars, so maybe it's not as bad. But um, <laughs> I had I had ended up got getting an inherit uh, not an inheritance. My father had made an investment for me when I was seven years old in a company. He invested $1,700, and in 1997 that investment led to $50,000. That was my seed capital. So I put that money into Honesty, and then I ended up that was my salary in the first year. So it was pretty lean um, operation. And we had moments where we had to decide, are we going to pay for the kids' baseball league, or are we going to pay for our synagogue dues, or, or are we going to get on a payment plan for both of them? Um, but we were, we were always happy because we had a wonderful, loving family, and we still do. And so um, I'm not more happy since uh, Honesty has succeeded, uh, but I'm not less happy because <laughs> I was happy before, and, and, and just because we had that, that equation worked out the right way. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna write that down tonight. Write it down. And you can it share my, it. It's not in my closet. <laughs> like every, to watch it as I yeah. dress up. So yeah. one last question. Sure. This is probably the most important question okay. we ask all of our startup grind speaker. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. So what is the most important? Who is the most important superhero uh, or historical figure? In, yeah. And why? And why? Yeah. So for me, um, Dr. Martin Luther King is um, uh, th th an amazing leader because. Um, he had a he had a righteous cause. He worked for what he believed in. He um, had a justifiable anger and urgency, uh, the fierce urgency of now in what he wanted to do. Uh, but he also recognized that um, the, the that it was going to take time to to make it work. And he was able to bring people on to his. He didn't try to do it himself. He he had to to bring uh, have other people share his vision. Um, and um, once again, I think for him. The impact um, he focused on the impact, and and you know sadly wasn't able to fully see the impact um, manifest itself in as in all its ways, but um, absolutely set uh, this nation on a course uh, where I think we're still benefiting from his work. So I was wondering why you didn't pick the superhero because you wrote a book that was completely in comic, <laughs> comic books. books. I don't yeah. know if you ever seen Mission in the Bottle. It's yeah. completely out of comic book strip. Yeah, the we whole love comic. I love comic books. So if I had to go with the straight superhero, I'd have to go with Batman Kay. because he didn't have all the other bells and whistles, right? right? He came from a place of of pain and suffering. He's a little rough and on he the channeled edges, yeah. it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So, anyways, you told me you told me your your uh, historical figure, and usually we get you a. Uh, Usually oh. gets our startup grind speaker a gift. So oh, this nice. is 
autobiography bi- biography of Martin Luther King. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. Oh, yeah, you, no, you, you I can I read it now. So thank you. So, so start grinding. Make sure we you put, put it visible on your your desk, Absolutely. like your bookshelf. Absolutely. Like when you're getting a picture um, yeah. at the Wall Street Journal or something. <laughs> make sure this is on the back. Right? Awesome. All right. Thank you for coming out, thank ladies and gentlemen. So Seth Goldman. Thank, there you. We thank go. you for staying. I really <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so thank much. You. Thanks.